It is my father's vision and my father's dream to build this city. This is an experiment. I mean, it's a very expensive experiment, but nobody's ever done this before. Normally, engineering and the environment are diametrically opposed. In this particular case, it's the exact opposite. They're very much interdependent. Without the success of one, you won't get the success of the other. There's a construction revolution in the desert nation of Kuwait. Led by a team of mostly British and Australian engineers, an army of construction workers are creating a new city amid the arid sands, an eco-city designed to bring the life of the sea into the heart of the desert. To build it takes one man's vision, his son's drive, innovative engineering, a committed workforce, and a lot of big machinery. Already it is attracting the attention of the world's leading architects and city planners. For 18 months our cameras have followed designers, contractors, scientists and ecologists as they struggle to turn vision into reality. Months of constant pressure and unique engineering challenges. We knew we were tight, but this is showing that we're actually running quite a lot behind the schedule. If we don't see some mark change within two weeks, for example, then we're unlikely to make the program. If it works, this deserted corner of Kuwait will become a global sensation and change the way we build forever. Welcome to Sea City. Kuwaitis have a long history with the sea. They fished it and used it for trade. Now the dream is for every family to own a house on a beach by the Arabian Gulf and the chance to take out a boat for pleasure. But by the late 1980s, the country had less than five kilometers of sandy coastline left undeveloped. This is Fawaz Al Mazouk. His family owns La Ala a leading Kuwaiti development company. His father, Khalid al Mazouk knew his country needed more waterside living, and so in 1985 he proposed building at al Khiran, an unpromising region of vestries and tidal creeks near the Saudi border. It was the idea and vision of my father, Khalid Yusuf al Mazouk, and his dream was to build cities. We applied for six locations, and from those six locations, we chose this location for the main reason of it is there are two creeks and we use those two creeks to bring in the water. In 1986, the Mazooks approached a British engineering and design consultancy called Bureau Hapold. Terry Ely of Bureau Hapold worked with the Mazouk family and created a plan that was unprecedented in its scale and ambition. The Mazouks wanted to expand these small tidal waterways into a vast system of beach-lined inland lagoons all connected to the open sea, taking featureless salt flats and turning them into a new city. The land was low-lying, it's sort of classified, if you like, as a marshy area, so it's too low to develop on, the ground too poor to develop on. But if you start removing material to produce waterways. The material you remove for the waterways, you use to raise the level of the land. So that made this an ideal site. In an ingenious move, material dug out of the lagoons would be used not only to create a building platform, but also to raise the height of the land here, beyond any predicted sea level change due to global warming. But before work could start, war intervened. Iraq's invasion of Kuwait brought occupation and ecological disaster, as Saddam Hussein's retreating army set fire to hundreds of oil wells. It took years for the region to recover. And when it did, the new city had a rival, the mega construction projects of brash neighbor Dubai. 
These massive land reclamation and building projects begun in the 1990s have made headlines. That's because to build them, contractors must pump millions of tons of sand into the Gulf to create artificial islands. As plans were revived for Sea City at the turn of the century, the Mazooks were determined to do things differently. There are a number of such developments already in the Gulf, and I'd like to think that you can achieve a good environmental solution at the same time as a good commercial solution. Many developments are developed on the basis of a grand idea. Maybe the grand idea is the shape, but that hasn't been the case in this development. The grand idea here really has, has, has always been the environment. Before work began, they commissioned this, an environmental impact assessment, which calculated the environmental costs and benefits of building here. This document would drive the whole design. It soon became clear that the environmental challenges went way beyond the skills of most engineers, and so they called in an expert, British marine biologist David Jones. Professor David Jones is a leading expert on the marine biology of the Gulf. The United Nations first brought him to Kuwait to audit the damage of war with Iraq, so he approached this vast new development with a deep knowledge of the flora and fauna of the region. I think if I hadn't been a biologist, I might have been an engineer, because I think both together, we are trying to create and solve problems. We brought David Jones onto the project so that he could help from an early stage to influence the design, rather than is so often, unfortunately, the case with, with designs that you know, a design is prepared and then later try and justify its impact on the marine environment. David Jones soon became a key member of the team. He needed to agree with the idea that a vast construction project like this could actually improve the environment rather than damage it. It was suggested not to build in the sea, but in the desert, and bring, if you like, the sea to the desert rather than the reverse. And I think, immediately to me, this is a wonderful idea. All construction impacts upon the environment, but here this will be mitigated by creating a new marine environment as the heart of the project. The environmental impact assessment findings became the team's overriding manual. It was a risk. They set up a rigorous testing system to monitor this, to make sure that the ecological balance sheet stayed in credit. This is where David Jones' expertise was vital, working hand in hand with the engineers. If you have the right company, I don't see that uh, biologists should have any disagreement with engineers. I mean, it's simply, you're all looking at a common problem and looking for a common solution. But how exactly do you turn an impoverished salt flat into an eco-city teeming with wildlife? First of all, you need a project director. Fundamentally, we've had to create a city from scratch. Basic excavation of all of the channels, the improvement of all of the soils, the formation of all of the beaches, the electricity, the water, the building of the sewage treatment plants, the creation of the roads, footpaths, and all of these activities have had to take place before somebody can actually commence building one of the villas. In a 30-year career, Ian Williams has worked on BBC corporate headquarters, London's Wembley Regeneration, and the Saudi Arabian National Museum. But this is his biggest challenge by far. A hundred thousand people will live here eventually, in a city the size of inner London or Manhattan. Most will have direct access to a beach. Work began on the first phase in 2003 and the second in 2005. With phases A1 and A2 already full of water and the infrastructure complete, the pressure is now on to complete A3, the third and largest phase so far. In total, more than 84 kilometers of new beaches. Right now, we are over 60% complete on our earthworks in phase three. What you'll see out there in a year's time is what you see out there with the water. You'll see those waters flushing in, naturally occurring, 
into that area of land. We'll have water from the gulf heading inland naturally flushing. That will look out there like a sea. The network of lagoons across the first three phases will provide the waterside living that Kuwaitis crave and space for two marinas, big enough to take boats over 100 feet long. Since nothing like Sea City has ever been attempted before, there are no off-the-peg solutions. The design team must innovate constantly. The lagoons will carry the water deep into the site. Digging them is a huge challenge. In fact, before the contractors can start work, they have to deal with a massive problem lurking just below the surface. The land here is not easy to work, and that's because it's packed full of one of the construction industry's greatest enemies, silt. Formed by changing sea levels over millions of years, the fine soil particles found in this area are waterlogged and make the land soft and unstable. Any structure built here would soon sink. When I used to walk on the ground, I used to get stuck. When we started bringing in the machines to work, we lost several of them. Just below the surface, this is silt. There's a lot of it. It's saturated and it has to go. Andrew Higgs is responsible for ground condition investigation and monitoring. I will be watching to make sure that the silt is all taken out. Um, during their routine excavation. Without removal of that silt, you can't improve it and you would have to do complicated foundations. Andrew is supervising the digging of a test pit to check on the extent of the silt in a new sector of the site. Very bad. We certainly bad. confirmed yeah. our suspicions. Yeah. Silt this deep requires an innovative solution. Jan Oosterveld heads the construction division of the company. He is responsible for all the earthworks at the site. A massive job. So finally we came to the conclusion that uh, there is no option than just dewater it, select the silt layers, dis uh, dispose of the silt layers and fill the area up with suitable material, mainly sand. The first step is to drain the water from the saturated ground. The dewatering process begins with a giant crane weighing 87 tons digging massive trenches. Each scoop removes 10 tons. When the soil is sufficiently dried out, they go in to excavate. They dig silt from two areas, the sites of future buildings and the beds that will form the base of the new lagoons. But with the huge quantities of sand needed to replace the removed silt and the general looseness of the desert sand here, something dramatic has to be done to firm up the ground and prevent buildings subsiding. Things are going to get noisy. The term is dynamic compaction. Dynamic compaction is the dropping of a weight um, onto the ground so that it has the equivalent of a small earthquake on the ground to, to compact the particles together and to push everything down. We drop our weights from some 12 metres and it's a 15 tonne weight, so it is quite uh, explosive force when it hits the ground. It is a 24 hour a day operation and we do something like 1,200 drops each half day shift. If they didn't compact the land, a house built here would soon subside over 50 centimetres. First, the team set out the area to be compacted using wooden pegs. This carefully designed grid is based on a tried and tested method. A crane then drops the weight onto the point 15 times. The craters are inspected to make sure that the compaction has been successful. 
The ground is then leveled again and the grid pegged out ready for another five drops before a final inspection. Life at the site is dominated by digging, moving and compacting the ground. A huge logistical exercise masterminded by Jan Oosterveld that goes on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The quantities of silt and sand being dug are staggering. In the first phase, about 12 million. In the second phase, uh, 22 million. And the third phase, where we are 90% completed right now, it was uh, up to 40 million cubic meter. That's 74 million cubic meters in total, enough to fill London's Wembley Stadium 65 times over. The construction of A3 has had a major impact on the whole area. The waterways that will connect it to the sea will create a new island. An island that will need a bridge. And phase three cannot be opened until that bridge is complete. When the bridge is completed, sea water will flow beneath it and fill the huge new A3 marina destined to be the largest marina in the country and an important commercial focus of the new city. Parallel to the road bridge is a second one, designed to carry essential services like sewage and drinking water over the future lagoon, which the designers decided was essential for access and maintenance. If we put it under 10 metres of water, they're not going to be able to get down to service that pipe. This pipe here, delivers 45 million litres of water a day to our water towers up for this particular project. So if we don't have a means of accessing this pipe at all times, we lose continued water supply for this particular project and that would be a catastrophe. Sea water will soon flow under these bridges, filling up phase A3. The lagoons will eventually reach over seven kilometres inland. But how will water so far away from the sea remain fresh and healthy? The project will not succeed if the water quality is poor and it stagnates. The answer lies in the science of flushing. When Sea City was first designed, the lagoons were aligned with the prevailing winds to assist the natural flushing power of the local tides. So we've got a city here which is built on predominantly shoreline. We've allowed to build fingers in a, aligned with a wind. We've got a central spine of water which runs down there, so it allows this water to come in, pump in through the tide and flush it out. It's all naturally circulating. But as the lagoons reach ever further inland, tide and wind are not enough to flush the furthest reaches of the site. However, the green philosophy of the project dictates that only natural forces are used to flush the lagoons. It's a puzzle, and the answer to it is large and metallic. Computer modeling showed that the tidal action alone wouldn't flush the lagoon network completely. The unique solution was giant metal gates controlled by the force of the tide. These will drive water around the A3 network of lagoons and back out to sea, creating circulation. When the gate has swung open, the, the water is going at full throttle at mid-tide. Through this one gate alone, there'll be something of the order of 40,000 gallons per second passing through where we are sitting now. That's 7.2 million gallons per minute passing through all three gates here. Each 10-ton gate will be hung on huge hinges. The incoming flood tide will force the gates to open and allow water to pass through. Then when the tide turns, the natural head of water forces the upstream gate shut. The downstream gate swings open to allow the impounded water to flush the lagoons. This is the theory. To verify their findings, the team recruited local scientific help. Dr. Karim Raka and Dr. Khalid al work at Kisir, the Kuwaiti Institute for Scientific Research. Both men were involved in remodeling the tidal flushing system to make sure there would be no danger of stagnation. We found that there were some stagnant areas, so what will happen in these stagnant areas, you will start getting a deterioration in water quality, especially in the hot summer months when you have high water temperature and without any flushing or the water being renewed, you'll get 
uh, water quality problems, and that uh, we try to avoid, and that's why we introduced the tidal gates. You need to flush it uh, naturally with the, with the tidal cycle. So when you have the gate, you force the flow to be moving in one direction, where it can go through the, the stagnant point and can create more mixing. Leaving nothing to chance, scale models of the gates were tested at one of the world's leading hydraulic research centers, the Danish Hydraulic Institute in Copenhagen. This proved that they could work. The incoming flood tide will open the gates at one end to allow water into a three kilometer section of the A3 lagoon. When the tide ebbs, the weight of the water in the impounded area will close the downstream gates, but at the same time force the upstream gates open, thus directing the trap water to flow round the system. It's like a natural pump. So whatever volume goes into this impounded area, which will be some millions of cubic metres, will be pushed round the development and it'll make the water circulation very efficient. It'll ensure in the more landward areas of development that there's good circulation and therefore good water quality. If all goes to plan, the entire lagoon system will be flushed and kept healthy using only the power of nature. The amount of pumping equipment that you would need to push this round, in itself, it's, a, it's an initial major capital cost. But most important, once you commit yourself to pumping, you pump forever. Building a self-flushing water system at the heart of the project solved one problem. But there are other, more surprising challenges. Once the lagoons have been dug, attention turns to forming the beaches, one of the prime selling points of the site. Eventually, there will be almost 250 kilometers of new beaches here. You might think it's easy to find sand in a desert nation, but this is the wrong sort of sand for beaches. There is a solution. Wash it. All of it. Four times. Every day, working day and night, they wash and sift 4,000 tons of sand. What they are looking for are large, coarser grains which are perfect for making into beaches. But there have been setbacks. We have problems in A1. We have the sand that was put on to the our project had a lot of fine sand and had some silt in it. So we had to dike A1, dewater the whole thing, clear it, take all the water, take all the silt out, take all the sand out and wash it, and then put it back in. Each new stretch of beach has stone groins built across it as barriers to prevent the energy of the waves moving the sand around. We design the groins differently internal than we do external. The internal beaches are meant to be uh, stable. The promontory beaches here, which are exposed to the more open sea wave, they're designed to move with the storms as they change direction and evolve over time to become natural beaches rather than a more straight, sort of man-made beach. Chris Rose and Jamie Holmes are checking the beach profile on the most exposed part of the project. The groins are performing well. Yeah, as you can see, they're doing a good job of containing the material. It's not, it's not passaging around, around this groin here. Looking back over our surveys, there's been some reorientation of the beach. And you can see that it's, it's become quite embayed. Yeah, quite natural though, isn't it? It's quite a naturalised sh uh, shape. Yeah, yeah it's, it's working well and, and there's, there's certainly no threat to the, to the properties behind us. Once the beaches have been meticulously formed, the water can be let in, as it has already been in phases A1 and A2. With flushing so important to the success of the project, an intense series of water quality tests is carried out in the waterways by the on-site team. Their results are then independently analysed by KISIR. We conduct tests daily around the project of 14 locations. And it demonstrates to us that the project is exceeding our expectations in terms of water quality. They take water and sand samples from the shoreline starting under the water and below the low tide mark.
Further samples come from the beach to check that the condition is stable. All the samples are then taken back to an on-site laboratory for analysis. When we take the sample, the first key test is a visual one. If we're seeing black sand within the sample, that means that it is anaerobic. There is a lack of oxygen within the sand. Um, next, we take it to the laboratory where we do grain size distribution analysis. And we're looking to see whether or not the original sand we laid on the beach has developed more fine grain materials from, from the air, for example. And the important thing there is that it potentially limits um, the oxygen available to habitats within the sand. The testing has shown that the water quality is impressive. But the real proof of the quality of the newly created habitat is the number of creatures living in it. Marine biologist David Jones monitors the wildlife surveys to understand if the idea of a construction project actually creating environments is really possible. We now have 800 species living in that area, which just shows how the water quality has improved. So this has been a very successful experiment. I mean, it, there's, nobody's ever tried this in the world. 800 species already living in what was recently a desolate salt marsh is the culmination of years of planning, hard work and hope. The summer of 2009 is critical for Sea City with work continuing on A3, the largest phase yet undertaken. The immediate priorities are the road and service bridges. It is not until they are completed that work can start on the final stages of the huge marina. The new marine life will have to coexist with the planned leisure uses of the new city, particularly boats and jet skis. The completed site will have five marinas. The A3 marina will house up to 700 boats. The A2 marina with deep water access to the Gulf will accommodate 300 much larger craft. Simon Arrell, marina consultant, is visiting to discuss progress with Ian Williams. And Kuwait is the largest boating market in the Gulf. People think it's the UAE, but it's not. Kuwait has something in excess of 20,000 boats. Um, what is very strong here is the fishing market. The, the local people very much like to go out 10, 20, 30 miles in the Gulf and do blue water fishing. Well, marinas are so important to projects on many different facets. It provides the, the heart, the, the, the focal point of the whole development. It really will be the lifeblood of the project. The vast A3 marina can only be flooded once the rock work is completed, but work is falling behind schedule. Progress has been held up by a delay in obtaining rock for the revetment walls of the marina. Well, the biggest problem we have in creating a rock-faced marina is the fact that Kuwait doesn't have any rock. So we're actually having to bring all of this rock from quarries in Saudi Arabia. And of course, that's a very slow process, uh, transporting this rock through uh, international borders. The rock for the marina work is selected from this quarry in Saudi Arabia. Large pieces to fit the stone walls, known as the revetment, are graded and sorted. They are then loaded onto lorries for the 150-mile cross-border drive to the site. It looks really good, it looks really good. I mean, it must be costing a fortune to place all the stones so precisely like this, but the end result is, is, is really great. And um, from the perspective of the yachtsman, I mean, he, he's looking at beautiful masonry work, in effect. Once they let the water into phase three, the whole of this enormous basin will be flooded, making it the largest marina in Kuwait. While work on the marina continues, project director Ian Williams is dealing with another major issue deciding how to assess contractors who will be invited to tender to build the tidal gates that will flush the lagoons in the areas of the site furthest from the sea. We ended up selecting a company called Tima from Cardiff in South Wales. Um, and clearly they were able to demonstrate to us that apart from being competitive, 
had a very clear track record of manufacturing and installing hydraulic structures. Now that was key to us. Without these functioning properly, the whole flushing regime of this lagoon system could fail, and that would mean the project would fail. Here in Wales, the gates are being fabricated prior to shipping out to Kuwait. They will be crucial to the success of the entire project, ensuring circulation of water around the lagoons. There are six gates in all, and they took six months to build. Each gate is seven meters high, six meters wide, and weighs 10 tons. To fit with Sea City's commitment to sustainability, these gates have been designed to need little maintenance during their 50-year lifetime. Each of the gates has been specially covered with a thermally applied aluminium coat to protect them from the highly saline waters. It's midsummer in Kuwait. Temperatures can reach over 50 degrees centigrade, but work on the vast Sea City project goes on. Continual dredging, draining, digging, dumping and dynamic compaction means that this is a 24 hours a day, seven days a week operation. To keep the site running smoothly requires 40 bulldozers, 90 articulated dumpers, 87 excavators, 48 dump trucks, six huge cranes and a host of other machinery. After a final concerted effort, the Road 278 bridge opens on schedule. It's a key moment for the team and a rare chance to pause and celebrate a job well done. The official opening is made by Kuwait's Minister of Public Works, Dr. Fadel Safar Ali Safar, with Assistant Under Secretary Engineer Abdulaziz Al Khreb. Water will soon flow under the bridge, creating a massive island surrounded by the new lagoons. It's a time for celebration and reflection. The uh, minister seemed impressed. He, he took a great deal of interest in the project and asked some uh, very interesting questions. But of course, uh, this was a milestone on the project and tomorrow we, we move on. Phase A3 started in 2007 and will extend the total of the new beaches to 84 kilometers. The team now just has four months to complete this phase in time for the seawater to flow down these channels and lap against these brand new beaches. The process is called water in. When they did it for the earlier phases, there was some celebration, but for A3, they are planning to make a much bigger splash and hoping that the ceremony will be performed by the nation's ruler, the Emir of Kuwait. But there is still a lot to do to meet the projected October date for the ceremonial flooding of the A3 lagoons and marina. And work is falling behind schedule. The main problem is the revetment, the painstaking process of lining the walls of the A3 marina with rock. Project director Ian Williams has called a meeting to check on progress. We knew we were tight, but this has shown that we're actually running quite a lot behind the schedule. Okay. So in terms of projected date based on current progress, what are you looking at? Well, this, this, is, this is realistic. This hasn't been too idealised, and we're looking at... Um, it's going to be um, end of December. End of December? Yes. Based with it on the current. On current. Sorry, this is actually slightly better than current productivities. Well, this, this is a good week. Which we think we can achieve the increased productivities. Well, we know we can. Yes. We know we can. Why increased productivities to get it back to end of September? No, just to make this product. Well, this that's, program. that's. No, that's, that's correct. All right. 
Because so that's not going to be acceptable. No. The wall around the marina is over a kilometre long and 10 metres high. The team laying the stones into these revetments have been working hard and placing rocks with precision. But this quest for perfection has caused them to fall behind schedule. It's a problem that the management team must solve and solve quickly to have any chance of hitting the October water in date. We were looking the other day at one section of the revetment and essentially you had one excavator picking up one rock from a stockpile 15 metres away, tracking it over to the position, placing it down on, a, on the slope. The stones are so heavy these guys can't move them. Excavator goes away, picks up another rock, spends a couple of minutes trying to select that rock, comes back and they've had four guys trying to move this one rock around. If we don't see some marked change within two weeks, for example, then we're unlikely to make the program. We're starting to run out of time to, mm. to rectify things within. So unless we can see some shift within two weeks, I think then it'll need a total rethink as to what we do. From now on, the revetment workers will get daily visits from the management. The new schedule is extremely demanding, but if Sea City is to hit its most important deadline so far, they have to make it work. But this massive construction project is about more than rocks, stones and concrete. A key element of the city's green ambition is found here in this nursery, where these tiny plants are part of a unique experiment using mangrove and other salt and drought tolerant species. Kuwait is the most northerly point where mangroves have ever grown, so any plants that flourish here will have to be carefully selected, bred and nurtured. Australian marine ecologist Ron Lachlan manages this bold and unusual initiative. Get your island one. Can we have a look at the flowering mangroves? Yes, Dr. Ron. There's lots of mangroves and flowers in island one, actually. There are more than 200 plants. They all look very good here. The young mangrove plants are taken from their nursery and planted on the islands in the middle of the new lagoons. Once established here and elsewhere on the site, the mangroves will provide nurseries for young fish and other marine species, as well as stabilizing the marine bed. Ron Lochland is on his way to check progress on Island One with the site's full-time marine biologist, Nithyandan Manikam, known to all as Anand. They meet with Salik Javed Butt, who is responsible for the day-to-day -day care of the plants. Good morning to you, how are you? It's nice to see you again. Morning, Salik, how are you? The plants will have to be tough to survive and, eventually, live without watering. And the plants are responding quite well to the, to yeah. the, to the salt water? We haven't observed any sign of stress so far. I can yeah, see there's a lot of flowering healthy. going yeah, on here, which is a good sign, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good sign. And when you went from uh, like 50% seawater to, yeah. to 80, there's been no decline in, in growth? No, sir, no decline. Absolutely no. The fact that they're flowering shows that there's, not, there's no stress at all. I mean, they're doing, doing extremely well. Yeah. Excellent, good. What we're trying to achieve here is, is to use salt water from the Arabian Gulf for irrigation and to utilise salt plants, which are called halophytic plants, salt-loving plants. And it's the first time that has ever been done in an integrated approach anywhere in the world. So by the middle of July, the hottest time of the year, we'll be on 100% seawater? Yes, definitely. Yes. Good. That should test to see how... how how robust these plants are, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure that we'll have no trouble. On this island we have a range of uh, salt tolerant plants. The classic, uh, the uh, mangrove that you see growing here in the intertidal zone. And so what we've achieved here is to have a, a coastal landscape which is totally independent of fresh water. I'm quite pleased with this. I mean, look, we've got a lot of flowers here. Yeah. Which is amazing. See this? These are only one year old. Yeah. So that means that the plants now well established. It's yeah. actually, those roots are used yes. for gas exchange. So. That's right. It's gone beyond a seedling stage now. It's actually, it's actually developed into an into a adult, yeah. you know, semi-adult plant. Most of the developments in the Gulf up until now have been, uh, coastal developments have been actually built in the marine environment, in shallow water habitats. So they've impacted on those marine resources. This development has actually brought the sea inland, which is unique.
the lagoons and marinas of Sea City's latest phase, called A3, are almost ready to receive 3 million gallons of seawater from the Arabian Gulf. But there's a problem. To finish lining the walls of the marina, they need rock. Kuwait does not have any, and supplies from neighboring Saudi Arabia have just been cut off. When we were getting 30 trucks a day, we're now not going to get any. So they've literally just halted uh, deliveries out of, out of Saudi. We needed something like um, another 4,000 cubic meters of the actual underlayer filter. Um, that's, I know we were concentrating on the arm, but we've now probably don't have enough of that actual filter itself. Well, we'll have to see if we can substitute that with uh, crushed concrete and yeah, hopefully it should do the job. Project director Ian Williams and his team have to work fast. First of all, they quickly redesigned some areas of A3, making slopes less steep and so suitable for lining with smaller rocks from their existing stockpile. Then they go on an urgent hunt for alternative materials, a hunt that leads them to this site on the outskirts of Kuwait City. Here, old concrete is crushed, graded and recycled, making it usable in new construction projects. With re-engineering, some of this material can be used as an underlayer in the revetment work. It's also environmentally a good way of dealing with it because we're actually taking the product and rather than quarrying material out, out of the desert, uh, recycling a material that no longer has any use. Quick thinking and re-engineering has remedied a difficult situation. There's now enough material to complete A3, although the planned later phases will require a new solution. But delays over the rock supply have added to other problems. After detailed coordination, a date for the water in ceremony is agreed. The Emir of Kuwait will let the water flow into what will one day be the largest sea city in his nation. The overriding ambition here is to create a new marine environment. That even affects the revetment work. Only rock work above the high tide level is filled with mortar, leaving gaps in the lower areas as a place for marine life to colonize in the future. In the flooded sections of the site, the result has been everything that the designers hoped for and more. You don't often have the opportunity to see a growing environment to see something that's starting from nothing and becoming a living body. By the day, we are seeing how the whole area is flourishing. Over the past five years, independent ecological consultant Dr. David Jones has conducted annual surveys. These have demonstrated how the newly constructed ecosystem has already attracted a huge variety of marine life, some of it quite rare such as the elusive ghost crab, which has an unusual domestic arrangement. He makes his hole and he takes the uh, sand and he builds this castle. This castle is to show he lives here to the female. So when the female comes, she sees this and she knows there's a man there. <laughs> and it's very rare, it's very rare. Today he's on the site again planning the latest species survey. No one has tried to bring water into a desert like this before. The annual surveys give an insight into how the new marine environment is continually evolving. One way of checking the numbers of species is through night netting. The lights on the beach attract fish, helping establish a picture of what is living in the lagoons. Dr. Jones is accompanied by Anand, the site's resident marine biologist. I see it, look at that. When they come round, they yeah. bring it really this way back yeah. towards different, the different. light, otherwise we won't. This way, this way, come to the light. This is the uh, goldfish, basically. Ah, yes, and there's the, the, the mullet. See the bits? Yeah, it's fish. lovely. It's more diverse. Basically. Yes. There's a lot of species. You can see mm. the one spot sea bream. Yes, bream, yes, yes. Other bream varieties. It's a blue swimming crab also. It's a male. Male, yes, yeah. 
The conditions are so favourable that the team made an astonishing discovery during the course of a fish survey in phase A2. Despite being under threat elsewhere around the world, new coral is growing here. There are about four or five species of corals encrusting into rocky bottoms. And in a couple of years' time, they will develop into a wonderful reef for sure. And th that place is full of fishes and other invertebrates. The reef has al already started building in that place. So that itself will give a wonderful picture how effectively this habitat has been functioning in these days. The finding of the coral really did uh, sort of cap it for me uh, in, in, in seeing that you know, the complete ecosystem was actually now in place. And providing nothing happens to, to fundamentally destroy any of that, I just see it continuing to grow and continuing to be a success. And finally, after six years of work, one of the key moments of the whole development is imminent. Millions of gallons of water are about to flood the massive A3 at the touch of a button by the Emir of Kuwait. The complexity of coordinating the Emir's visit meant that the date was only confirmed three weeks before water in. It's been a scramble to get all of the details sorted. The team has put in long hours to create an exhibition and organize a ceremony fitting for an auspicious visitor who has backed the project for over 20 years. It will be the defining moment, and in recognition of its importance to Kuwait, the Emir has allowed it to be named after himself, Sabah al Ahmad Sea City. It's been absolute mayhem from the, from the time we were given the date as to when the Emir could come, uh, to creating what we are going to do working with the various uh, event people and graphic designers. There will be an exhibition, and the team has created a film show to illustrate the history of the project, leading up to this moment when the Emir will name the city and allow the water to flow into the new phase. But the event is about more than just the Emir's patronage. It's not just an opening and a renaming of a city. Hopefully it will let people understand what we're all about, what this project has done and, and what we've tried to achieve. And I think a lot of these symbolic images behind will, will actually hopefully hit home to people that this is an environment, this is really special. Apart from the Emir and the Crown Prince, a host of Kuwaiti VIPs, diplomats and invited guests will witness the transformation from engineering dream to fully-fledged city. Each guest passes through the exhibition of the site into the main hall. After six years of round-the-clock work, this imaginative construction project in the desert of Kuwait is on the threshold of its biggest step. The Emir presses a button and water gushes down the pipes into phase A3. Water's flowing, and it's time for reflection. I'm very glad to see my father's dream on reality. I accomplished his dream and put it on reality. It took almost three weeks to fill A3. For some, it's time for a break. But there's much left to do, starting tomorrow.
The tidal gates have arrived on schedule from Wales after a 3,000 mile voyage. It will take two and a half months to install, check and commission the six gates. Before the water can be let into the rest of A3, the team will have to solve the issue of the remaining rock required to complete the revetment work. Then it's on to A4, and the next phase of this huge development that will one day be home for 100,000 citizens of Sabah El Ahmed Sea City. A4 is another 42 kilometers of new beaches and another 3 million drops of a 15 ton weight to compact the soil. It is a huge thing. We, we're taking water so far inland now, six kilometers. We, we, we're going to be achieving something I don't think many people have ever, ever achieved. And this is a momentous occasion and we shouldn't forget that. In engineering terms, this is no mean feat. In the final analysis, Sea City will stand or fall on one question. Can construction on this huge scale and the environment really work in harmony? It wouldn't have mattered what we built on the land if that didn't work. If that didn't work and became a stagnant body of water, who would want to live here? The project would not be what it is now. You'd more or less fill it in. So that was key. Without that working, it was a unique selling point. It is working. We've succeeded. We've achieved.